Marina, but... Depois de apresentar, né? Oh, hey, hello, everybody! <laughs> Oops! Some How are words. you all doing today? I hope you're all doing good. Uh, let us know the place where you are watching us from. I'm based in Brazil, so I'm in the capital of Brazil right now, and I'm pretty glad to be here at the Jakarta EE Talks with Otavio Santana. Hello, hello, everybody. My name is Otavio Santana. I'm also from, from Brazil. However, right now I'm living in Europe, in Portugal, in a small city called Liria. Uh, that's a lovely city. If you enjoy history, when the pandemic situation is over, you can join me to visit the whole castle. Nice, nice. And today we are here to talk about how you can architect and deliver Java applications in the cloud era. So what has changed? How Java has evolved over time? What are the different ways to deploy on the cloud? And uh, wow, we have people from all over the world today. Hola, Hola Juan. Ju, Ju from Slovenia. Salud, Jihad. Uh, whoa, Guilherme from Mexico. Oh, that's nice to see a lot of people around the globe. So, Iraq and Israel. Perfect, yes. India. So, okay, that's nice. Today we have a uh, one hour and a half talk, more or less, sort of. And my I'm running out of voice, so my voice is going away. So please bear with me. And if my voice starts failing in the middle of the talk, Otavio, it's all up to you. <laughs> okay, Let's... so guys, hopefully Karina is, is able to finish the presentation. <laughs> uh, one important thing, so that's interaction first presentation. So if you have any question, we are looking to the chat right now. So any question, any comments, let's, let, let us know because once you put that comment, we will read this this message instantly so please let us exactly know. so we don't like to wait until the end of the talk to for the q a session we actually like to present and talk to you at the same time so feel free to share any comments any questions anything so let's get let's get started okay Tavi? okay let's get started so perfect first what of gonna all, do today? Otavio, i am going to actually present to you before we start okay so Otavio okay, is ahead. currently a Java champion. He works on different specifications. He's also a leader of the of the JCP group, X specification group. I can never remember the name because this is so <laughs> Oh big. yeah, that's a huge one, but Java community process, JCP, uh -huh. and this is executive committee. So if okay. you don't like Java 8 or higher, that's all my that's all me. Oh Sorry my God. That. He also <laughs> is a frequent committer for the Apache and Eclipse projects. Also being a leader of Eclipse projects and writing books and blogs on his free time. It's a okay, pleasure to be here okay. with you, Octavio. So let's talk right now with the one amazing person on my side. So by the way, uh, happy Women's Day. And today we talk with Karina Varela. He is a principal technical marketing manager at Red Hat. So yes, he's amazing and principal in every kind of specific topic. And key contributor, uh, he, she created a Motu Tech Founder. So it's a podcast. Right now we have on two languages, in Portuguese and also in English. Uh, she is so Java organizer, instructor as well. And yes, besides that, on uh, her free time, she writes books and articles about Java technology and key and a lot of a lot of things. So yes, whatever she's is amazing. going on on my side, Otavio, I like to yes. write, write about it. So yes. as you can see, we've been around for a while, more than ten years now, and we see a We saw the shift to the cloud environment and how the shift on how we are now delivering applications and this is what we want to talk to you about today right Otavio? yes the magic behind the cloud exactly so actually before we start we should discuss about what is actually a cloud like why did we start moving to the cloud what is the origin of it and uh, how do we do it okay again that's my point because i love history and that's by the way that's why i decided to come here to liria so a city of castle uh, 
there is no uh, relationship, direct relationship between cloud and agile. However, what can I say is after agile, the cloud become more and more popular. Why? Because the whole goal of agile methodology is to deliver it fast and at least fast as possible a, a product. So that's why they had the agile manifesto and they has they have these four approach. So individual and interaction over process and tools, working software over documentation, customer collaboration over con contract negotiation, and responding to change over following the plan. So the whole point here is basically to have it on your mind that why do we have agile? The agile methodology was born because we want to decrease the it make faster the release product and how we we do that with break down the silos everything is about to break down the silos that's why the whole point of agile is make your our client closer to us so instead of put the clients outside and wait like one year to release a, a, a version we can try to release with more frequency so the client can give us more feedbacks right and finally, we have the opportunity to put the client, the client close to the developers. And, and but there's some issue about that because we put the clients close to the developer. However, we forget about the operation team. And that is not enough, right? So I have the products, I have the source, I understand the product. However, my product is not on the production yet. That's why we decided to go deep on that breakdown silos to, and then we create the, the DevOps culture, right? The whole point is to make the developer to work together with the operation. So instead of wait a long time to deploy application, you can decrease this, this kind of time to do it fast and fast and fast. And yeah, there is some so, ideas, so, so go ahead. That, that like we had this evolution on the way we deliver projects in the software in the project management uh pillar and now we also have an evolution on the technology pillar where we came up with the devops right what about no ops yes. what is it about oh yeah the whole point here about no ops is, is to decrease enough the operation to make easy to even a developer can use that for example when you talk about pass Platform as a service. And Karina, what is Biz DevOps? Yeah, so we are trying to break down the silos across different uh, different uh, pieces of the, or the organization. And when we came up with containers, we could break up the silos, break down the silo between dev and ops. So we got these two together. Although we still had a silo a wall of confusion right in the middle of the business team and us, the tech people. So we needed a way to um, build this bridge in between these silos and get these people together. And the way we can do it is by adopting the biz DevOps culture, where we have also a, a way to have artifacts that both business people and tech people can understand and then that can be delivered as in, in the way that ops people can understand so that's mostly uh what's up with the biz devops but now that we know what happened on the project management uh pillar also we saw what happened on the technology pillar we now have different ways to deliver software but not in the process itself but on the on, on actually where we are in, implanting, deploying that software, where are we deploying it? And then comes the cloud. So you said that this, everything we just said is linked to the beginning of the cloud era. Is that right, Otavio? Yeah, so right now we have no idea what does cloud mean to us. However, the whole point here is to talk about cloud is somebody else's problem. The whole point is, okay, I I am a software developer, I'm a software company, and I don't want to rush about some details of operation. What do I do? Basically, I pay to somebody else problem. I pay to somebody else know-how, I pay to somebody else to help me on that. 
that's pretty similar when you talk about water service, energy service. I don't want to handle the water on my side. I'd like to pay to somebody else handle to me because that's not my goal. My goal is not to service water. Uh, so they, basically that's the whole point. Why I show Icaro here? Uh, the whole point is be worried because cloud is amazing and cloud has several features. However, if you go close to the sun, you can fall down. <laughs> okay, I guess your voice is making success in the presentation, Karina. So, but let's go on. So, cloud has several ways to think about it. So, cloud has a huge uh, kind of service that's a pretty similar to pizza. So, let's try to do the analogy between pizza and cloud. And on my left side, I have uh, the whole technology on my on my side for example when i decided to make a pizza at home right so i need to have at least two things the know-how i need to have need to know how to make a pizza how to prepare everything and also the infrastructure so cheese toppings tomato sauce pizza fire the pizza prepare the table prepare the dining table oh, and um. On the tech Everything side, this, this could be compared to providing the storage, to providing the network, the machines, everything, right? Yes. For example, I decide to have a service in Japan. So I buy to you, Karina, tickets to go to Japan to rent a house, to install the servers, to configure the servers and pay monthly my energy bills, the internet and so on. So that's basically the So the let's make say you want to delegate. Way delegate parts of this what how could we get started with the yes okay. infrastructure let's, as a service let decrease a little bit of the complexity and pay to somebody else to handle that problem to us so let's go to take and bake so basically the whole point is let's go to the marketplace uh buy a ticket already and then just put in the fire so i decrease the, the number of know-how and also i decrease the number of knowledge to make the pizza. So basically you need to put in a microwave and that is infrastructure as a service. So I still need to know a little bit, however, not much as I make at home. So I decrease the complexity. I increase the, the abstraction. So it's probably much easier to me. Okay, so at this level, someone would host the machines for me and care about networking, for example, and storage. So what about PaaS? Oh, PaaS is the point where you decided to increase even more, right? So in the pizzas, it's a pizza delivery, so you don't need to handle the, anything else. So take the phone, call the pizza, or maybe use some delivery applications such as Uber Eats here in Europe and the US and iFood in Brazil. Uh, and that is it. You just need to prepare the table or perhaps you can eat so, pizza while you're watching us. So could you give an pass. example of a pass platform? Uh, for example, Hiroko. So basically you as developer don't need to handle the whole configuration. You don't need to handle the, the installation of the database. So you have the source, you plug your source there and the whole management of infrastructure plus the service that your application needs belongs to somebody else, such as Heroku, for example. Okay, so I don't like washing the dishes, so I actually wanna, want to, uh, want a, I want another option. I don't want to, to do anything. I just want to use, to eat the pizza, let's see. Okay, you have the option dine out, but let's think about the future where you are able to do that, right, right Karina? So, uh, you can go to restaurants, you eat the pizza, and that is it. So don't need to, to rush about anything else. And that's amazing because the whole complexity belongs to somebody else. The whole problem belongs to somebody else. Uh, I don't need to have the know-how. I don't need to have the infrastructure. I don't need to have anything. I just need to have my wallet to pay to this kind of service. That's exactly something where I decide to go to dine out. So I don't need to prepare the pizza. I, I don't even know how the pizza works and then you stay there sit down order it and that is it so and pay for the bill right so that is it so please an example of SaaS. why you 
exactly what you're using right now. So if you're watching us on YouTube or probably you are using Gmail or something like that. So basically don't need to, to, to know how this thing works, right? So just it's, it's ready to you. And remember, everything has a trade-off. So if you go to SaaS, it's decreased the it's uh, the risk. However, probably will be more expensive this way. So need to handle. If you go to the last one, where you need to do everything by your home, probably it's cheaper. However, the raw risk is on you. Okay, I see. And as you can see in this diagram that we created, you have several options other than just yeah, SAS or PASS. So these are the ways you can actually deploy your application today. You can host just the infrastructure or have someone providing the platform, or you can just consume the software already delivered. Although we have some other flavors that are coming out of, uh, that are, are emerging from these existing ones. One example yeah. is the CAS, right, Otavio? Which means container as a service. Yes, yes, you're right. So basically, if you go to the NIST, uh, the standard NIST, you right now have the definition of cloud. And the three, three ones, the three first ones are the pillar of the whole approach. And based on that, right now we have more and more extensions and more der derivation. As Karina said before, we have a container as a service or cars where it is exactly in the middle between uh, YAS, so it's and PASS because it decreases the complexity. So it's not comp there is no it's not complex enough to be, be a YAS. However, it's still difficult to use. It's not able to be a pass. So it's exactly in the middle between yes and the pass. That is the cast. Okay. Difficult and to use. That's not the proper way to say it, right? It's not. It's not as uh, straightforward that as, for example, the pass environments, because you need to do some extra steps, right? Yeah. The point is, me as a developer did need to do need to know something else than the developer the code, and that's my point. Oh yes. So if you are exactly. If you're a Java developer, then you need to know how to install a database. Yeah, you should, you should do, no, but usually in the cloud it's more difficult. So because you need to think about the password, you need to think how to update the user and the password and so on, the credential, the security and so on. The whole point is when you have calls, calls we need to delegate to somebody else to hand it to us, or we need to have this know-how. Mm -hmm. And when you go to not to pass, no, you don't need to have to, to know anything else than the code itself. Yes, basically when you are working with a CAS provider, you will have the orchestration platform where you can deploy the containers that you created, see? So this part will be automated for you. So on the other hand, Otavio, what we have are the managed application services, which means that these are not SaaS because they are not the applications ready to use, but these are actually services to help the developers de produce faster. Why? Because they will not have to worry about the database. They can just use a managed database. Or they do not need to know how to install Kafka or how to configure Kafka topics because they can just hire managed event streaming platform from some provider. So they then they can just deploy the application and connect to these uh, cloud uh, services. That's why we I called them I called it like managed application services because it's not SaaS, but it's managed by someone else, right? Otav, it's still on the cloud, it's still somebody else's problem. It, it's still in the cloud, yes, yeah, still somebody else's problem. And besides that, uh, the goal is more to developer because usually who handle the database by your bare hand is developer. It's not a normal user yes and correct. also we have the function of the service oh yeah that is uh, true and the serverless is a back end of the service so basically don't need to handle all these things oh there's one question from juan manuel gonzalez in the example of pizza how cars fit on on it exactly so like what have you said the three main pillars let me put my here. So the three main pillars are YAS, PAS, and SAS. Okay. So what comes with CAS is that you have a layer that is in between YAS and in between SAS because it would be 
uh, you would have like infrastructure provisioned, you would have networking storage in the or container orchestrator platform, but you would not have, uh, for example, the the easiness to that that prov uh, Heroku provides, for example, or platform message. Do you want to add to this, Otavio? Yes, yes, no, no, that's fine to me. Uh, Juan, if it, that's not clear, please let us know. We'll keep on uh, trying to answer your questions. And folks who are watching, please interact with us. We love interaction, okay? So, Otavio, now we know how we can de deliver different uh deliver our, our application in different platforms ac across the cloud we know that we do not have to reinvent the wheel when we have for example services that already provides some uh functionality that we need to use and when we don't need, have the know-how we can just consume it okay so we already know this we already know the platform the the environment but how about the application itself? What about cloud native applications? <laughs> Whoa, so yeah. cloud native, yeah. it's a concept. It's it's a thing, this concept, right, Otavio? We really like to discuss about this concept. We love to discuss about it because it's more it's mostly more about philosophical definition than the definition itself. Cloud native is, is a young definition, and you can see several companies, and usually if you read like three different articles, you will see different uh, three approaches or different three definitions about cloud native cells. For example, if you take a look on Pivotal site website today, uh, cloud native is an approach to building and running application and take advantage of cloud computing model. And that's this one here is a wonderful book and that is attaching cloud native application. And to this book is basically more about operation than software itself. The whole point is to make the infrastructure more easy to deploy using infrastructure as a code, uh, and also make more scalable as possible. There is an article from InfoWorld. So in general, use cloud native as an approach to building and running application. And it's not about uh, how, or it's not about where, but how the application is deployed. So if you take advantage of cloud, it's a cloud native to InfoWorld. There is this amazing book here, this cloud native development, and it created a new word, DERS. It's uh, about deploy, update, replace, and scale. The whole point here is, again, to move your infrastructure or operation to easy scale and one easy way to you implement CI, CD, and so on. Oh, this one is my favorite book because uh, Cloud Native Transformation, the authors said that it's much more than software development and also much more than operation. Basically, it's a methodology that embraces everything about software development. For example, in the past, we had waterfall. Right now, we are working with uh, agile methodology. In the future, we're gonna work with cloud native transformation where everybody will look into the cloud more naturally than today. And there's this organization that's a CN, oh, sorry, go ahead. Otavio, there's a thing I want to comment here. So, so far we have seen different definitions. As you can see, it's not a standard yet. We do not have a final statement that says what is cloud native. And now we are going to talk about the cloud native computing foundation statement for that. And that is uh, one of the most recognized ones, like because it's from the CNCF, right Otavio? Yeah, this one is CNCF. And he put several sample of definition of cloud native. Uh, to be honest with you, Karina, that's not my favorite favorite because it what? puts several buzzwords. Because it puts several buzzwords in one place and say, okay, if you use something modern like this, congratulations, you are using cloud native. And that's not enough, right? For example, what happened if you decide to go to monolith? Is that a cloud Ooh, native or not? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe. Because as far as Dep I know, there is no silver bullet, right? So I can exactly. use silver bullet 
with cloud native oh sorry i can use monolith with cloud native why not that's the question actually that's why we are trying to figure out the concept itself so octavio okay and yes there are several books that look to cloud native as a chronological definition for example we began with cloud and then we had the cloud friendly and then cloud ready and right now we have the cloud native application basically if you have an application that was born in the cloud think in, in the, around the cloud congratulations that's a cloud native application ah come on you know we always discuss about these topics right you know that so <laughs> I think that for about those concepts, the, the thing to take away from, from this discussion is that like cloud, cloud friendly is that application that you had that was not born, born. Uh, the, it, it was not created with intention to be deployed on the cloud, but at some point in time, you had to convert it to an application that should be containerized, that should be deployed on somebody else's infrastructure. So you had to adjust some stuff on it in order to make it work. That's the cloud friendly one, but the cloud ready one, it actually uses APIs, exposes specific APIs, follows some standards that makes it behave better in, for example, orchestrated environments, container orchestrated environments. And then we have Octavio's definition, right Octavio? Yeah, right now, uh, some some people know I'm I'm helping the Jakarta E and also in MicroProfile, and Jakarta E is has the approach of cloud native application, and I decided to write several books, several articles to have my own definition because the definition not ready yet, at least you don't have the standards, and to me, so it might have might change sometime, but to me right now, uh, March eight is a set of good practice to optimize your application or any kind of application to go in the cloud through three points, containers, orchestration, and automation. Perfect. So we have discussed the origins of cloud. What are the options for us to deploy our application on the cloud? And we have discussed the concept of cloud native applications. And uh, next thing we hear in the Java world, Otavio, it's always the same thing. Java is too heavy for the cloud. Me, me, me. So what about <laughs> that? What about that? <laughs> okay. So there's huge discussion around Java in the cloud, but yes, we are ready to that. So let's split in three points. So let's talk about Java as improvement to cloud native and then go to Jakarta and MicroProfile. First one, Java. What's going on with Java to work better with cloud native? The first point is we have several optimization to garbage collector. We have several improvements in the container. So the first improvement in the Java world was the JVM. We had a better integration with containers with more memory and we have finally have a release every six months. So instead of wait like three years, we finally have the opportunity to every six months have a release uh, where we can enjoy more the JVM itself. Okay, so, and one important thing here that I'd like to say is the improvement is about the container itself. It's not about Docker. So if you use any kind of container, the JVM will improve to you this application. Okay, uh, cover the next slide, please. Uh, and that's the whole point. So besides I have several improvements in the JVM, we also have the Jakarta E, right? Jakarta E is a product under the Eclipse Foundation. It's work with a giant methodology. The whole point is to release every year a new version of Jakarta E. And the whole goal is about cloud native, right? So that's what everybody wants right now. Uh, and that's Jakarta E. And let's move on to the Eclipse microprofile. So what is the Eclipse microprofile? Briefly, so please understand that. It's a small piece of Jakarta E, so it 
you took three APIs, CDI, JAX, RS, and JSON Beam, and then create several APIs to specifically to microservice. It's also under Eclipse Foundation umbrella, and it's really has a release every fourth time in the year, and for sure it's faster than Jakarta E. And as you can see here, Eclipse Foundation has several APIs to help the Java developer to to make an application in the cloud. So we have right now the newest version is Jakarta E9. So it's a big man where we break several package. We have several what? APIs. We broke it. <laughs> yes, unfortunately you broke it. So the whole point is instead of use Javax package name, it's become Jakarta something. Oh, so, that's because of, yeah, that's because of the name changing, right? Yes, that's because the name changed. Perfect. And also have micro profile with the, the workspace, working group, sorry. And as you can see, we have several APIs. So open tracing, full tolerance, open API, REST client, metrics, JWT authentication, Jakarta CDI 2.0, and much more. Okay, I see. So Java is evolving faster. We have Jakarta EE. And we have also micro profile for the applications that are more lightweight. And with that, we come to a very um, mature and full of options ecosystem. As you can see, today we have several options to, de to deliver Java applications, uh, either with Jakarta or with micro profile spec. And you, you'll see new frameworks for those who are working with Java for longer. Uh, you will see that we have new frameworks like Helidon, Micronaut, uh, Payara, Quarkus, and they are all adopting the new microprofile standard. Is yeah, there anything so else you want to comment here? That's wonderful because based on these standards, we are possible to use more features. I mean, you can create some wrapper on the, this kind of specification. For example, take for example, Spring, Quarkus, and, and that's happened because we have a strong community and also we have a strong, strong uh, specification team to help on this side. Mm -hmm. But there is always complain about Java Cloud and serverless. Is that true? Oh, yes, so indeed. So basically, when we are working, like when we before the, the boom of Quarkus, we used to work with applications that took a while like the, the the startup time was fast but not as fast as it is today and we are going to talk a little bit about this because the way the most traditional way to have applications running is using JIT right Otavio the just-in-time compilation and what we have now as the difference is the AOT the ahead of time compilation so basically this allows us to compile the code uh directly to the to the to the code that is understandable by the machine that we are deploying the application. So when we do that, we are actually doing the work from the inter interpreter and the C1 um, algorithms in the JVM in order to compile this before we execute it. So it's really 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 fast. Although although there is always an although, right, Otavio? Although yes. what happens when we have like long running applications, what performs better? Uh, for sure, the JVM. The best analogy is the, when JIT, you try to compare. You mean, right? Yes, inside the, G, the JVM with JIT. Mm -hmm. it's, it's like we try to define a race between a motorcycle and a plane with one mile. Probably the motorcycle will be faster than the plane. But that does not mean that you can cross the whole ocean with motorcycle just because the first mile, the motorcycle is faster than the plane. So we need to think about this. The whole point of serverless is the application will run once and then gone. You don't need to do run optimization, don't need to have a garbage collector because it will run just once and then gone. Perfect. And this is there since Java 9, I think the option to compile classes in, with ahead of time uh, compilation. And uh, if this is pre getting pretty hot in the Java ecosystem because it allows us to deploy Java code 
Well, for these use cases that we mentioned, remember that there is no silver bullet. So for the appropriate use cases, it is uh, getting really adopted when you are going to the cloud and you need resources that are lightweight and then start faster and execute really fast. So it's uh, becoming a thing, right, Otavio? It's already a yeah. thing, actually. It's, it's already a thing, yes. So you can enjoy your application with serverless, with Java, if without any kind of problem. Perfect. But let's move on, Karina, because we mentioned twice the orchestration and choreography. Please let, let us know what the difference between them. Perfect. So now we know that we have the ecosystem to deliver our applications. We are well supported by the Java standards on the, on the market, and we have several options on the cloud. And then we start to come up with several services because we have smaller services. Therefore, we have a bigger number of services running on this for this to achieve the same goal. And we need to make them interact somehow. So we need to either use orchestration or choreography to have them uh, interacting. So if you think about uh, Uber Eats, for example, I'm sorry. So if you think about Uber Eats, for example, it, where you have four services uh, to do the order, to accept the, receive the payments, do the execution of the order, and to actually cook the order, and finally ship this order. If you think that you have four services, how would you make them talk to each other? Would you make like endpoint to endpoint communication? Is that the way to go? Is that really the best way to go? Like every time? Sometimes, well, maybe, but imagine what would happen if the number of services increased here. So think about it. So let's first talk about choreography because uh, like one of the, the most prominent voices in the microservices community is Sam Newman, who wrote this book, Building Microservices. And he said that you can either use a service to or orchestrate other services. So these orchestration services take care of invoking the other services in order to achieve the final goal. OK, so this is the orchestration. When you go for the event driven, when you go to the event driven or uh, orchestration, choreography, I'm sorry. When you go to the org to the choreography strategy, you actually create services that are independent and decoupled from each other. And instead of invoking, it actually reacts to events or it admits events. So in this example, for example, uh, in this example, each service would be responsible for notifying that something happened. So, okay, I received an order. That's it, that's an event then the other services would react to this event. Oh, there's a, a new order. I need to, I don't know, invoke the kitchen in order to cook it, okay? So um, with that being said, we can think about the uh, use case itself. So let's say that, uh, talking about choreography, okay? So okay. let's say that a, a new order was created and uh, we, the service will emit a new, a new event, new order created. What would happen is instead of invoking another service, the service can actually react to it. So it will see, oh, a new order was created, so I need to process the payment. Next, it finished the payment, and the execution service will see, mm, a new payment order uh, event was emitted. I need to start the execution. My execution is done. Finally, the shipping service could react to this event in order to uh, start the shipment. Karina, but how do they communicate? How do, do they see these uh, events? Actually, through the broker. We can think of technologies like Kafka, who are really popular in open source, that can actually serve as the communication layer. So it's, it, it doesn't have any business intelligence. It's just there for the communication, just to handle the events that happen. So it has the broker. And whenever um, a service needs to emit uh, an event, it will publish an event to a topic, for example, and multiple services can subscribe to that topic in order to uh, react to the events. Okay? Is that clear? Yes. Yeah, that's wonderful. Perfect. Let's move to the because next usually step. Usually, when we talk about choreography, I just have in my mind Macarena, stuff like that. But right now, I understood that. They're more than Macarena on choreography. Will you dance the Macarena for everyone here? Oh, again? I did, like, several ah, times. Okay. 
<laughs> okay. <laughs> so <laughs> now we should talk a little bit about orchestration. Why? Because orchestration was heavily used before where you had, we had a large and heavy orchestrator, a platform that could, that had hold the business logic and it knew where to call uh, each part of this, the, the architecture, each service in the architecture. So how does that evolved to something that we can actually use in cloud environments, right? So we start with traditional processes where we have a lot of manual tasks. So we have still talking about the same uh, example of Uber Eats, a really simplified example. We have a human task uh, where someone needs to accept the request. Based on this, we can either notify the customer or cook, pack and deliver this event. With service orchestration, what we can do is actually change some of these tasks to automated tasks that can invoke like this, I can have the invocation of an external service. So I would uh, start uh, decoupling my, my service and start interacting with it. But here I still have orchestration because as you see, there is one centralized place that knows the business logic and knows when to invoke each uh, endpoint directly, okay? Next, we have the shift, Otavio, to what is a mixed way of orchestrating these services in the cloud environment. What we do have right now is the possibility to not only invoke directly, but actually to emit events through business processes. So as you can see here, this can be a process that is started, it reacts to a Kafka topics, to events published on Kafka topics, and whenever a new event is published on that Kafka topic that it that this process is listening to, a new instance will be started. So it will actually fit in an event-driven architecture because once it finishes, it can actually emit events or react to events that happened on the ecosystem. So this is pretty useful for those who still have business processes uh, to solve to address and automate and needs to fit into a event-driven architecture. So as you see, the benefit of having these types of solutions is that for manual tasks, we can start adding AI. So for example, we could add prediction and recommendation for human tasks. So whenever a new task comes in, the person would see, mm, whenever I get this data, I, this is the decision I usually take. So we can mix all these features in order to have the best solution for the final user. With this, we can move to the best practices on Java because Otavio, we already spoke about the architecture side of it, but what about the application itself? Like, how do I code Java well? What about this? Will you give me tips and tricks or will you point me to the right direction, please? Yes, yes. The first one for sure is most popular that everybody mentioned is the 12 factor application. One important thing you. about sorry, go ahead. this is <clears throat> this is not something new, right? This didn't come up with the cloud era. So why do we yes, still talk about it? It did not come out with cloud era. However, it's become popular because Viroko decided to rewrite and put it as the 12 commandments. So Basically, the whole point is to make easy to you take your application and move to Heroku application. Yes, it's based on this book here that's even, uh, it's write, written by Martin Fowler before the Amazon AWS become popular, so 2002. Uh, I don't go deeply. I'm not able to go deep because the time is not enough, but basically, uh, if you have application piece, use a repository, use a management to your dependence instead of for the library inside the code, the source code, for example, Maven, NPM, Gradle, something like that. Configuration, please don't put your password, the credential inside your repository. The whole goal, the, the main goal here is a developer does not need to know about the credential on production, okay? 
the whole point this is on production. This was already a thing. So, Otavi, this was already a thing with enterprise applications, but we used to separate this, for example, using the application server. But today we separate this using the container orchestrator, right? We just set environment variables wherever it is, and the application yes. can use it, right? Yes, we improved on that side. So right now it's more overwriting environment configuration. Uh, instead of go in some XML file configuration, and it's on my perspective, it's much easier because you can redefine really everything that you want. Beside the operation configuration, that is, there are these books here. These are amazing. No, no, the next slide. Yes. Uh, clean code, clean architecture, DDD, effective Java. So briefly, okay, clean code so you are, you are telling me that if I want to know the best practices for Java, I need to read all these books. Yes, the three, the three, the first three ones are if you are a developer in general, and if you are Java, Java developer, the three and plus effective Java. And yes, usually right now you can see several articles that say, okay, if you go to microservice, go to microservice is a bad practice. However, that's not totally true, okay? So there are several books that include the new uh, San Neiman books. And he usually in the, the beginning of the book said that, okay, there's no truth that you must use microservice because everybody else are using, is using. So, this book here is by a friend of us, Edson Yanaga, and he wrote and he said basically, just because Netflix and Amazon decide to use microservice, it does not mean that you need to use because the, the site you use because it probably you are not a Netflix and Amazon company. In general, microservice is more to get scalability in the people instead of application itself. Perfect. That's why I put yeah, the Cobalt cool. Law reference so you can go deep on that to know more about it. So, but the code is not enough, right? So, we need to understand how to take my application, write in Java, and use bad practice to combine that with containers, Karina. Please tell us why and how. <laughs> well, if you talk like that, of course I'll, I'll tell you why. But, uh, yeah, the this thing looks here, like metric boy music, right? So tell right. me why. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> Sorry for that. So go ahead. So uh, one thing, Otavio, I want I would like to ask. So do we need to use containers to be cloud native? Because we are talking about best practices on Java on the cloud era, and now we are going to talk about containers. So is that a must? This is important. However, there's a couple of articles that said, okay. Cloud native is not about uh, containers. So there's a culture around the cloud native. The whole point is everybody has your own definition of cloud native. To me, it's yes, but to somebody else, probably not. <laughs> and if you don't have the standard to cloud native, that's fine. Perfect. So as of today, what we are seeing is that most companies are migrating for containerized application because it's easier for ops, for example, to deploy it. Or you can deploy it anywhere the same way you do with any application. So that's why we are going to now talk about how you can use best practices for Java and containers. So first of all, you should know that Docker is not a standard, okay? So there is the Open Containers Initiative, which is responsible for actually defining uh, what should an image has, to defining the standards across the image creation and the way that you run your image containers, your containers. So an example of this is that, for example, you can, instead of using Docker, you can use, hey, Mr. Zohi from Bangladesh. Uh, you can use, for example, Builda. With Builder, you can create an image that follows the standard, and Docker images also follows the standard. Does it, Otavio? I think it does, right? The yes. OCI is, okay. So you, whenever you create an image that it follows the OCI standard, for example, with Builder, you can create it, run it in a container that uh, with whichever platforms that supports the OCI uh, standard. An example is you could create a container using Docker or using Podman. So there are there are several other options uh, for us to get started in the container world, Octavio. Whoa, that's amazing. So tell us, what is Podman? So Podman is a technology that allows us to actually execute 
the the same comments that we do with Docker. So you can run um, you can run your images and manage it just the same way you do with Docker. There is even a, a developer advocate that I saw once, Otavio, that he was so used to using Docker, but he didn't want to use Docker, but he was used to reusing the Docker command. So he installed Podman and created an alias. So whenever he taught, he typed, for example, Docker PS, it was actually running Podman PS underneath. So he's like, <laughs> I, I don't want to change the way I work, but I want to change the technology. So it's literally, you can run it the same way, okay? So there are some stuff you should know about the moment you are creating your image. The way you create your application images matter. Otavio, and if you want to say anything, just interrupt me. You know I talk a lot. So feel free to interrupt me, okay? No, no, go ahead, Corina. <laughs> okay. So think about two moments when you are creating an, uh, a container, okay? There is the moment where you build the image, so you are creating the image, and there's the moment when, where the container will run. So you think about build time, and you think about um, run time, okay? So first, let's talk about the build time. When you are talking about the build time, you need to know that uh, you should also care about the single concern principle, which is similar to the S in solid pattern, but in this context, each container should solve a single problem and solve it well. If you need to do something else, maybe you could go and add, for example, a side a sidecar or use another image. So remember the single concern principle. Another thing is the self-containment principle, which means that every library that your application needs to run, everything your application needs in order to get started should be within this image. So it's self-contained, okay? Next. Oh, and by the way, we go back to the 12 factors because if you have any environment variables, you would, for example, configure this. Uh, if you need any configuration, you will do it via environment variables, okay? And uh, finally, we have the image immutability principle. This is one of the most followed principles because this is what allows us to have scalable applications because each time you scale an application, you know it will be exactly the same because it's immutable. You don't change the thing that is running within a container, okay? So create, um, when creating the image, think about these three things. Now, on the runtime side, we need to worry about four other things. Otavio, there are so many things when you are running an application in the cloud, right? Oh, boy. So, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so in the runtime, what we do have is the high observability principle. So the application you are delivering within this container needs to be highly observable. It needs to provide the APIs and the logs, for example, uh, to collect where the the ecosystem can, co can collect, the metrics can collect the logs. So you can use and plug into your application, for example, Fluentd, Logs, Dash, Prometheus, or Grafana in order to get to know what is going on in your pod, okay, in your container uh, or pod, depending if you're running on uh, Kubernetes. Um, thinking about the container. So the other thing is the lifecycle conformance principle. So you should use graceful shutdown whenever you're you whenever you can. So you should worry about how is the way that you're going to what is going to happen when you start your container and when it shut downs. Okay. Next is the process disposability principle. So this is linked to the immutability principle because when you think about this principle, the process disposability, you should have in mind that the container is volatile, okay? It can be destroyed and recreated as many times as we need. So your contain you should have in mind that the startup time and the shutdown time should be quick, okay? And this is where we go back to everything we already spoke about Java and AOT, for example. Uh, Finally, the last one, which is the runtime confinement principle, where since we follow the self-containment principle in, in build time, which is the image is self-contained, then 
um, these applications should only use the resources that we provide to it. Okay, so it's contained in contain confined in this sense. Otavio, I spoke a lot already. Next, oh, we should talk about CI/CD nice. because, it's like, always amazing when you talk. Mostly because I have no idea what does mean CI/CD. Ah, come it's on, you don't know. No, no, no. <laughs> I mean, I love music, so can I use the CD to put some music to play? Mm. Can you tell us a little bit more about what is CI, for example? I have no idea, Karina. So go ahead. You, you explain so clearly. So teach mm. us mm -hmm. what mm -hmm. does mean continuous integration. So we have already spoke about everything, like where we can deploy Java standards, Java applications, um, how to orchestrate services. Yeah, right, Luis, right? How to orchestrate services. <laughs> and how to create the images when we are building the, the image and when we are running this container but what about the delivery traditionally we did this since forever otavio since cloud we already did this before containers ci cd it's something everyone knows about it but not everyone does it right because you should know that for example when you are practicing ci continuous integration you should build your software, build your database, and run your tests at every change, okay? At every ch change you do. So you should co op up. You should commit frequently. You know, that's something, that, Otavio, have, have you ever committed a broken code? Yes, who doesn't? It is a proper way to start an application, right? You need to oh. broken and then fix, because, well, what else? Scout? Uh. what else can I do to keep my job? So I need to create bugs to keep my job. Oh, I see, I see. <laughs> and then you create the unit test to guarantee that it's broken, right? That's why you create a bug. Ah, oh, I gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> so we still need to tell people to create unit tests and all tests should pass. So if you're doing this, you're doing CI, right? And then you think, yes. am I doing CD? But there are two types of CDs, Otavio, and, not, and it's not CD and DVD. It's like continuous delivery and continuous deployment. Okay? Yeah, something is wrong. I mean, <laughs> I like the compact disk one. By the way, let's no, go no, ahead. No. Yes, let's go ahead. So just a second, Otavio, really quick. Okay, so CICD, as I mentioned before, the whole point is about deliver the applications fast and break down the silos. And continue to deliver, continue deployment. The whole goal here is once you run your CI and you you open, if you think about GitHub, for example, you, you open a PR, you need to run the whole test, right? So you, you run the whole test, probably somebody else will you do the code review, review if everything's okay. And when the code uh, is reviewed, it's tested, the next step is to merge this brain to the master or main. And then what's going to happen, Corina? Please tell us. And then, then we can deploy. <laughs> oh, yes, it's deployed. But that's not just go the code in the master, but it's going to be live, the application exactly. with that code change. <laughs> So that's the biggest difference in between, for example, continuous delivery and deployment. When you do CD, you get, you do everything, but you do not deploy it. You will have your package ready for deployment. Either it fits a jar, if it's a, a, a native file, if it's a war file, it will be there, but it's not, be it's not going to be deployed. When you have continuous deployment, then yes, you have the CI CD with co CI and continuous deployment. So have that in mind. Although Otavio, we are talking about cloud, cloud and cloud. How has how the how has this shift shifted to the cloud environment? Well, what we see is that before we used to have those servers, let's say Jenkins, for example, uh, that would do this task of knowing like how to build the pipeline and etc 
we would have the workers and yeah that's how we, we did it so today in cloud native environments we actually need uh, cloud native ci cd tools so that's why we uh, there are new tools on the market like tecton for example that is a serverless ci cd server you can just define whatever the pipeline is a, in kubernetes or in openshift for example and it would trigger each task within a, its own container and it would do everything without a master server for example like we used to have in the in the jenkins world so as we move to a, a cl hybrid cloud environment because of all that scenario that we explained at the beginning we see that the engine should be able to grab the source code packaged in it package the application in a container and deliver to whichever cloud environment it is either it's physical virtual apply a private or a public cloud okay so that is all that happened within this time Otavio. it's a lot to learn right i don't know if folks here are already in this world but it's a lot for those let's say i was in the in the in coma for five years oh my god i would have so much to get up catch up so <clears throat> mind-blowing yes it's too much good thing to learn so we've talked a lot right now and i think it's time for a small demo that i prepared is there anything you want to mention before i go to the demo otavio no go ahead corinna so okay i can show the code if you want but if you want you can go no it's okay so guys, let me show you here. And I'm sorry about my voice. Today I just woke up with this, yeah. It is what it is, but here we go. Yes. So remember we are talking about uh, micro profile specification. So here I'm use, I have a application that is built on top of Carcass. And this application is an application that can automate travel uh, requests, okay? So we have, for example, travels and whenever you have you want to travel to a place we need we have an application that can not tell you if you need a visa and if your visa is approved you will actually get a hotel and a book flight a hotel and a flight booked for you okay finally remember when i told you that we can have event driven processes this is what we have right now so this is all my application is it has here a um, automatic check based on decision tables i'm using libreoffice here so please don't mind about how it looks i really don't dislike this but you can see that uh these are my business rules okay so whenever i have a destination country that is us but the person is polish then a visa is required so this is my business rule it's pretty easy to understand i don't have to look at any code and that is what is being invoked right here okay so this file that i opened is this one right here um as you see when i apply for a visa i have a human task and the event is going to be fired who is going to react to this event the application that is going to react to this event is the visa application okay this visa application has another process and this process right here is responsible for checking if the visa is approved or rejected it also contains business rules okay but these ones are uh, implemented with drl and uh so basically this process will re is a service and the other is another microservice, both running on Quarkus, okay? These processes are now, uh, so the, the tooling that is actually providing us these process capabilities and rules capabilities with event-driven uh, possibilities here is Cogito. So these Cogito applications are actually deployed in OpenShift running right now on the cloud and in openshift i have deployed this through an operator so i have an application that uses a um that uses business process capabilities with cogito that uses a key value store with infinite span and that is going to communicate with each other using stringzy which is the open source version um 
for Kafka by Red Hat. So you can, we are going to communicate using StreamZ. So I have the three operators. For Cogito, you can see that I have the two applications right now, okay? And it's running. So remember we spoke about CAS and PASS. As you see, this is very technical. When you have a, so the BPMN extension I am using in VS Code is the Cogito one, is the business automation one. Let me show you here. Okay, uh, extensions. Yes, so BPMN. Business automation. So you can either use this one by Red Hat. Okay, this is already a version that is compiled and tested to be supported in the official product, but it's free for use. And there is also the Cogito one that will have free, more frequent releases. Both today are on the same status, but you can use uh, the one you, you prefer. And it, with it, you can either use open like BPMN and DMN files and test scenarios, okay? With this, I have my application deployed, my two applications. And if I want to check it up, I could just go to the routes, which are which were created. No problem, I have any way. Abandon it, abandon it, yes, anytime. Just let me know, okay, if you have more questions. And I have here three routes. Why do I have three routes? I have a route to my travel application, to my visa application, and a data index, which allows me to search through all the data in there. So the data index uh, has a GraphQL to help us, but for now, let's uh, plan a new trip, for example. When I plan a new trip here, I don't know, let's put Karina Varela, City Rio, an email here, whatever, zip code, and I'm going to be Polish, okay? I'm not, I'm from Brazil, but let's say I'm Polish. And I want to go to the US. I don't know, New York City, it will start at this time and finish at this time, okay? Whenever we do this, when I book a trip, a new event will be emitted and that's how the process will get started. Okay, so here, as you can see, uh, I already have a new request, okay, for Karina Varela, opa, aqui, to New York. The visa is required, so this was defined based on this, those automatic rules, and uh, it is not yet approved. So as you can see, I have yet no hotel and yet no flight, because on the process, we should be Okay. Because on the process, we are still on the part where we need here the approval for the visa. Okay. I have I will apply for the visa right now. So let me apply for the visa. Task apply for visa application. When I do this, the other service, so now I have sent this, and we have here an event-based gateway for those who are advanced users of BPMN. Well, if whenever I get a rejection for a visa or the visa proof, I will go to the path that happens first, okay? To the event that happens first. So let's see here. I have the passport number and the duration 12 days and I'll submit my application. On the, Cog on the Cogito visas application, I got a new request that is Karina in my here, US, okay? my visa was approved once my visa was approved it was approved so this event right here was emitted and published to the cafe topic and my dogs are crazy right here because we are emitting events for everywhere so i published karina but how is the configuration right now here as you can see i'm publishing messages to the visa approved topic okay once it's approved this message right here is listening to the visa approved topic. So I emitted from this process to say I'm finished and this other process reacted. So, okay, nice. I can now move on with the approval. If we go back here to the travel application, you will see that now my hotel and flights are booked. Karina, but how can I query these applications? So you can use, for example, the data index with GraphQL, and you can search either by the data that you have as variables in there, you can query it. So I'm searching all the travels. It's pretty easy to read, right? So all the travels where the traveler last name has var 
of Varela. So I can see here I have two travels, okay, for Varela. Uh, another way we can query, if we can, if we just want to go for a traditional way, we can go and query, for example, for the process instances. And for the ID, I could have, for example, uh, the, let's see, variables. And then I would have all the variables for each process. Okay, so it's pretty easy to deal and handle when you work with like that. Karina, but how are you coding the application? Like, where is the, the rest endpoints? Where is everything? Basically, that's the magic. Uh, Quarkus allows us to have the fast startup time, allows us to have the, uh, the lightweight environment to run on the cloud, and we can add the process management capabilities on top of it using Cogito. So Cogito is responsible for parsing this code, pre-compiling it before it, the application starts and have this, um, and, and generate the REST endpoints for you. So if you open the target, if the target uh, directory, you will see all the endpoints generated in there, okay? So, Otavio, this is an example of how we can deliver business applications, for example, in the cloud environment, following good practices. Because I already showed it done here because I was afraid of time. But it, I, we could show, for example, the best practices during the build time, during the container runtime. Oh, but, yeah, that's amazing. Yes. Because, for example, you can create and include the, the, the business rules easily, right? For example, right now. Also mention about travel. Right now, you need to have a test about COVID. So probably it's much easier than put several if on that condition, right? So I need to put just one more event there, connect, and put the logic beside. Mm -hmm. We need to understand that as architects and developers, we should have the tools in our toolbox to solve each problem with the right, in the right way. So if you need to solve a business problem, go and use a business uh, automation tool. If you need to solve uh, eventing problems, go and use event streaming platforms. So uh, if you have, for example, like Otavio said, a rule that you have too many changes, frequent changes, or if you have uh, business users that want to change frequently, let's say discounts in a store, for example, or if you have long business processes like loan approvals, or I don't know, any type of business processes that you can run in a company, those are also suitable for cloud environments. And this is all Java-based, running with Carcass, containerized, and running on OpenShift, which is a flavor of Kubernetes. So Otavio, you can see how uh, smooth it is to have like, event-driven architectures running on the cloud, okay? Wow, that's incredible. It's amazing balls. Okay, that's the right word to describe what <laughs> you showed to us right now. So, so go ahead. Uh, uh, with that being presented, I just want to go, Otavio, through it all. So to recap, quick recap, we learned. And if you don't refer if you don't remember any of these topics, you can go back and watch the recording, right, Otavio? Because we discussed origins of cloud. What are the options for you to deploy, deploy your application in cloud environments? Do you want to use YAS? Do you want to use SaaS? Do you want to use CAS? So what are the options? How? Where do I deploy? We discussed also the best practices on Java implementation, which basically Otavio just referred to a couple of books. So... <laughs> That's the tough part, all right, Otavio? Yeah, but you know, uh, if you enjoy IT, you need to understand that books are the key to know more things. So, totally. And, and everything beware. we shared here is based Those on our books studies, just, right? Yes, exactly. I mean, when you talk about, okay, that's not the right definition of cloud native, we need to go deep in self definition to have your own definition, right? So, it's a challenge, but. IT is an area that you need to read a couple of times, every time, and sometimes what you learned like one year ago is become deprecated this year. <laughs> Perfect. So, and we also saw the what, different options for you to containerize your application. What are the best practices when during build time of the image and during runtime of the container? 
we saw about the shift on the CI CD platforms, what they used to be and how they are right now. And we also saw uh, how we can actually deliver these cloud, cloud applications within uh, platforms like OpenShift. So, Otavio, with that, I think that's all we had for today right now. And I would like to know if you have any questions. You that is at home, you that are at home, do you have any questions for us? Please let us know because it'd be amazing if Karina can, can answer to us. Okay, Karina. get out. <laughs> Could you repeat the... So, ah, okay, Gerald, okay. yeah, Gerald asked if I could repeat the name of the tool for CICD, not Jenkins. So Tecton is also open source. Basically everything I work with is open source because uh, Red Hat is full open source. So it's a, uh, open source and it's backed by Red Hat because this is actually used on OpenShift pipelines. So you can trust that this is a tool that is actually being in production by many people around the globe. And this is the open source version. So just go for it, try it out. I really recommend it. Yes. So is there any more question? Give once, give twice. Thank you, everybody. So here you go. As you can see here, there's a QR code where you can get the whole reference, the whole book that you mentioned today, the, the Git repository with the code. So that is it. Hopefully you enjoy and see you soon as possible. And yes, stay safe at home. And hopefully we are able to do this kind of thing more close like a conference or any kind of meetup. Perfect. Otavio, there are some questions here. We should take it really quick. Oh, yeah, okay? yeah, yeah. You're right. Will there be more meet type meetups like this in the future? Yes, hopefully soon as possible. Let's take the question here. So just to confirm, so Cogito runs over OpenShift. Uh, Cogito is, you can think of Cogito as a capability that you add to your Java application. So the same way you add Panache to your Quarkus application, you can add Cogito. So it, you will be able to use like business process capabilities. So wherever you can run Quarkus, you can run uh, Cogito, for example. Uh, you can also use it with Spring Boot if you like it more. It supports both environments, both runtime environments, okay? Yes, yes. Thank you so all, thank you next... all. We thank you for being here with us today. Otherwise, it wouldn't be as cool, right, Otavio? Yes, it'd be boring if not you. So if you want to take a look at the presentation here, you can take this link here where you have a couple of references that include the presentation itself. Perfect. Thank you, Otavi, for sharing it. Okay, you do you recommend event management like Vertex or perhaps older? And how do they compare to Kafka? Okay. Mm. <coughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, my throat is really bad right now. So I, I'm not sure. I'm not an expert on Vertex. But what I do know is that Kafka, uh, Vertex is being used more as a reactive runtime environment for you to, to code your apps. And Kafka is more of the the, the layer where you, you do the communication within it. Yeah. You, are you an expert on it, Otavio? Yeah, on not Vertex? expert like I you, oh, but yes, you, you, <laughs> you can use Vertex with Kafka, by the way. So can you use the Vertex exactly. client to connect? Okay, let's take a link here. So Think yeah, like Kafka combine. is the bus. Kafka is the bus that takes messages to places, and you can have like Vertex yes. here, Spring Boot here, Quarkus here, all communicating via events that are going through Kafka, right, Otavi? Is the application service to handle that? You can use, for example, broker. You can use, for example, I don't know, some Amazon SQS, any kind of queue, and yeah, you can use Vertex as application layer API to handle that with reactive API. So yes, we can, those are different, so we can combine and mainly because they are not competitors. So they can work together. There is a last one here, Octavio, for us to take uh, from Zishan, who asked, what do you think comparing Spring Boot versus MicroProfile apps? So there we have, a lot of differences, right? 
not only on performance, but also on the way you write your code. Because if you are used of on used to working with Jakarta E or Java E, switching to MicroProfile is going to be pretty smooth. You won't feel it too much. It's pretty similar. But when you are working with Spring Boot, it's another world. Oh, Tavi, you know it. Full of annotations, yes. full of things. Those, it's important to say, those frameworks are amazing. You can choose Spring, MicroProfile, Jakarta E, uh, everything in the architecture. Soft architecture is about trade off. Mm -hmm. uh, in one hand, we have Spring that usually has more innovation, delivery fast, and have sometimes more features. However, it's, it's not a vendor a lock in. It's exactly. not a spec. Therefore, you have a, a vendor lock in. If you'd like to choose between another application, you're not able to. So we have a vendor lock in. And on the other hand, we have Jakarta E, that is a specification that built by a community. We have a, a huge amount of communities and companies behind Jakarta E. However, we need to make sure that everybody has a voice. And this process, has time to make it happen, right? Because you need to have the time to to make sure that everybody was listening to take any kind of decision. And this takes time to happen. And those are not enemies because if you like, take a look at Spring, Spring is a wrapper of Java E or Jakarta E. So if you take a look, for example, Spring Data JPA is basically a wrapper of Jakarta Persistent a API. Uh, Spring Boot is a wrapper from Savlet and so on. The whole point here is it's a trade off. There is no silver bullets uh, on that side. That is update to Jakarta EE name, new namespace. I mean, if you were going for Jakarta EE 9, 9, you already have the new namespace, right, Otavi? Yes. The, I guess the question is what happened? Does the Spring move to Jakarta ah, EE? Yes. Ta. They did, so they're they're looking for for that move. And as as far as I know, people the company behind Spring are helping a lot the Jakarta E community. For example, in Jakarta NoSQL, we have Oliver in the mail list, and Oliver is the guy behind Spring Data. And to me, Spring Data is the more mature solution when we talk about Java and persistence technology. Uh, for example, no SQL database. So really, 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 those are not the enemies. So they decided to put a wrapper, just go faster. And that's good to us because you can see what they did. If it's, everything is go right or everything goes wrong, you can just choose the best part of a spring and then find it as specification itself. Perfect, Otavio. Thanks for the, the answer. Uh, okay. Someone asked here, questions? yes, so, does it ahead. support MicroProfile? Yes, actually, uh, Quarkus is an implementation of MicroProfile. And, uh, ah. oh, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> yes, it's, so, okay, please go on. <laughs> yeah, let me just finish my thought, okay? And then you can okay, go to okay, that. Go ahead. But uh, the question is Cogito support MicroProfile? It, like, it actually runs. On, uh, it, it can be added to a micro profile runtime like Quarkus, or you could add it to a Spring Boot, for example. So it really depends on, on where you want to run it, either with Quarkus or with Spring Boot. It's your choice, okay? Yeah, Koito is amazing. Uh, I'm just kidding, you know, uh, because Quarkus does not support completely the micro profile because the CDI point. And there's no bad because we're talking about innovation. So Quark was an evolution in the area where they decided to don't use reflection. Uh, and right now they're looking to standard. That's why they, they are working right now in CDI light to make that possible. So instead of go the whole reflection on the runtime, the whole goal is to do this kind of metadata on the build time. And that's amazing. So. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you for the clarification. We are not enemy from Spring and also from Quarkus. But it's fun, right? So it's it's hard to <laughs> don't make this kind of joke. <laughs> sure, sure. 
Thank you, Otavio. <clears throat> so, everyone, I would like to thank you a lot for your presence here. Uh, see you on upcoming meets, meetups, right? Yes, we try to do more often this kind of presentation, right, Karina? By the way, yes, connect to us on Twitter so we can stay connected. So, I'll put my Twitter here, twin Twitter handle here on the chat. Uh, let's connect so i can know also a little bit about you because these virtual meetups it really restricts us on knowing who's here with us right now <laughs> okay thank you everybody see you soon